plotting along with doing what they do every day. It's just quiet desperation, isn't yeah. it, really? Um, and the fallout of that, Lukey, is that I ended up going to three funerals in two years of, of guys my age that had killed themselves. Yeah. Um, and no one spoke about it. No, None of us got pulled together as a team saying, why did this person yeah. commit suicide? It just wasn't talked about. It was just brushed under the carpet like they had something wrong with them. Yep. Even though we were all probably at times in our life thinking about doing it ourselves. Yep. And you just think, this is really strange. Well, you look back, like you said, you put a, a lens over it and you go, yeah, that's, that's pretty screwed up. Yep. So. Um, yeah, I I agree. And I think for me, when I reflect it, it that like every, the kids want every, we, we all just want to be seen heard and valued yep at the very center piece of anything we do yeah and that it's the thing that I sort of when I when I talk to people it's it's every action every decision we make yeah um, is based on wanting to feel something yep so we you know whether we decide to make a lot of money whether we decide to buy that car mm. do that marathon whatever it is at the very end point it's to feel something yep it's to feel worthy to feel enough to feel seen by your dad perhaps that maybe put the pressure on you to be something yeah but it all comes back to that wanting to feel yeah and again what we're talking about you know a lot collectively is that like when we build a better relationship with ourselves and when we mm. can open up real conversations, especially in schools and with kids in these days, that you don't need all that or you don't need to go through all that rigmarole to feel something. You can actually do it each day. Yeah, 100%. And that's that's what I think is the real power of, of if we build a, a better relationship to ourselves, we can have those feelings without needing to have everything else that complicates them. Absolutely. And I think... In the early 90s and mid 90s, that just no. wasn't available anywhere, especially in a, a small town like Sunbury, you know, and um, there's just no access to that type of thinking. Or so, you know, it makes complete sense that you become a, a product of your environment. Exactly. So, mate, was wellness, was health and well being and wellness always central to, to you and your, you know, what you did? Yeah, it was. Well, I loved footy like I said so that was great during footy season um and then in the off season I had my best mate lived five doors down the the street um and he was a a gun runner and so going on runs with him yeah um I had no option but to become incredibly fit yeah like he he would just push me and test me um constantly and then male ego and bravado it's not like he could fall off the pack um so it was it was an absolute blessing in disguise the fact that he was my best mate and that he was this absolute this freak of nature so we would run flat out all holidays um you know in the off season and i I got addicted to feeling really fit yeah and and i knew i was quite aware of my body at a young age that when i fell off the perch a little bit um that i felt like crap so um that's that's i think that's where the seed was planted for physical fitness which obviously you know the endorphin rush led to me being a a happier individual um throughout there and then and throughout the footy season um you know you you stay naturally fit um and that sort of formed my personality i reckon yeah leading into adulthood uh, and then obviously you sort of hit sixteen, seventeen, and drinking becomes a massive part and were you, of. Were you a big drink? Like when you got sort of eighteen to twenty three, for instance, was drinking a big part of your life? Yeah, I didn't start drinking properly till I was seventeen. Yeah, um, I know a lot of people in my community would start a lot younger than yep. that, um, but it, it just came with a vengeance. It, it had an absolute rocket under it. I think, you know, my mates and I, it was another way for us to to bond and we're talking about, you know, your personality or your subdued personality. Obviously, when you're inebriated, you're your best, you know, you can open up a little bit more and it, and it, and it create, it open up this whole new world for all of us. Thankfully for us, drug taking didn't come into it. The yep. fitness negated that yeah. and, and drugs were looked at back then um, as an absolute no, no, like pushing the envelope, even marijuana, which is yep. now looked at as a, a almost an aid in, in some way, in a yep. lot of ways. But back then, so it was just, you'd get on the piss 
um, after a game of footy. Uh, throughout summer, you, you, you know, you as long as you were smashing yourself during the day, going to the gym and, and running and stuff, you, you get wasted every weekend. So the fitness, the, the, the fitness and the football really counteracted a little bit the amount of drinking you would do. So you didn't go too deep into the hole of just becoming... An alcoholic. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. It was always um, an unwritten rule but with my whole crew and my little brother, who was 18 months younger than me, was that you'd stay in great shape, but then you could absolutely murder it on yeah. a Friday or Saturday night. It's really interesting, isn't it? It's that, that whole um, seesaw of, of two massive extremes. Um, yeah. So that was it. That was that was our whole life, you know, um, with your footy career and, and through summer. Uh, through summer it just became music festivals getting pissed and then making up for it the next day um do you think my like do you think now and because I, I think about this as well because you know it's a pretty mirroring story and it's it's not a unique story to a, kids that grew up in footy clubs yeah and this is really what happened yep if you're an overseas listener this is mm. really an inherent part of australian culture especially yep. in that that football 100 sporting circle um do you think Subconsciously, the wanting to drink and to get to that inebriated state is to get to that depth to have those conversations of real feeling, but feeling like you need to be at that state to to go that deep. A hundred percent. It's sometimes life's all about permission, isn't it? Yeah. And I think alcohol gave all of us permission to bond a little bit tighter. Um, you know, and again, it's inherently Australian, isn't it? To get on the piss with your mates, that's how you connect and that's how you you relate to each other and that's how you're able to share a bond at a deeper level um, outside of being able to share success in a game of sport um, or, or anything else. So, yeah, I think that was that was the gateway to opening up something that we didn't have previous. Yep. Um, incredibly sarcastic culture as well that I grew up in. So if you tried to bond on a level with anyone outside of those permitted areas, uh, yeah, areas, time, yeah. you screwed. You would have been ripped apart. Yeah, uh, you know, and 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 ridiculed, and 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 you know, we would pride ourselves as young men on how much we could rip our mates apart. Yeah, um, with sarcasm uh, to the point it still affects me now, Lukey, where I'm constantly checking myself in regards to my reactions and my sarcasm and stuff like that with my beautiful daughters, and so yeah, mm, really interesting. It so. is, and mate. So after footy, and you sort of when you left school. Yeah. What sort of took place in? Just a number of jobs that were taken up out of pure necessity and mindlessly. So they all taught me something. I went into um, the postal service as a postie for five years because my old man was a postie and it was an easy in for me. I didn't have to do any work to get it. It was an easy job for me. I got to stay fit and ride yep. pushies all day. Um, I paid really well as a young man. Um, it didn't force me to get outside of my comfort zone yep. at all. And I think there was an aversion for me to get uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, and then it was just, I was rudderless from that point on pretty much until I reckon I met my first wife and we had um, a first son at the age of 23. Yeah. Then I sort of thought, oh, I've got to really pick something here, and, and it was the fitness industry, which yep. was which I found really attractive. I thought I'll be able to exercise every day, uh, train all day long, and get yep. paid for it. Beautiful, and and the the idea of personal trainers was just coming in then. It was the early two thousands, uh, and so I capitalised on that and found out I was really good at it. Yeah, and and I thought primarily I was good at it because I loved fitness and yep. I could pass that on to other people. Since then, I know now pulling it apart and, and trying to dissect my personality and what makes me tick, it had nothing to do with fitness at all. It was about project development. It was about being with humans and watching them go, watching them grow yep. in a short amount of time and basically in a test tube. You could see where they were at. We had specific measurements, whether it was they were too fat, yep. they were too unfit, they hated themselves, yep. etc. There were all these metrics where you could say this is where you're at and there were numbers. 
And by doing this, we can get you to here. Yeah. And there was a development piece. And you could see that growth in, in that human. I wasn't aware of it at the time, but it was clearly present that that was important to me, that I was a carer. Yeah. yeah. And it's it's that ability to see an inefficiency, mm. whether it be being overweight or if you're a footy coach, you know, coaching kids, it's like you've, you know, potentially you could be more efficient kicking this way. And then yep. that want to almost project manage that to create a greater efficiency. Yep, absolutely. Um, of that person or that, that group yeah. of what you're trying to get. Did you notice that – were you still stuck in, though, as the PT, just the physical? And were you then – were you looking at the holistic mental part there or were you really focused on body, body composition? Uh, there was zero access to – the most important part of growth, which is understanding the mind and the ego and all of these things mm. that you and I sort of live in daily now, back then it just didn't exist. Yeah, it didn't. Um, you know, if a, a client wouldn't even talk to you about depression uh, back, you know, early 2000s, you, you would just, it would purely be physical. Yeah. Uh, behavioral patterns weren't discussed. You'd just say stop eating shit food yeah. and start eating better and, and that was it, you know. It was, it's really, really interesting. Whereas I would argue now, and I've been out of the industry for a long time, but I argue that that's probably a, a bigger part of the teaching and the learning as you go through school is is that the mind state. Um, I would hope so anyway. Oh, and that was... You know, where I went down sort of the meditation mindfulness part, you've gone down project management and and charitable work and mm. working with kids. You know, they're pretty much the same thing in a different shape. Yeah. Um, but if you're, you can be, you could have a six pack or, you know, if you're a girl, you could have, you know, the best bum you want mm. and have those ascetic looks and feels. But if you're unhappy, are you really healthy? Yeah. Like if you're, if you're still suffering depression or if there's huge amounts of anxiety or discontent within you as a person, the external makes very little difference if you're not a happy, healthy human. Absolutely. Um, and that's the sort of the the story we tell about health and well-being is that such little of it is physical when we can't love ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. Mate, okay, so you're, you're PT in, yep. you're sort of running a business. Where, where, whereabouts are you living at this stage? So we moved, uh, we had uh, my first son, Kai, in 2000 and we yep. moved out towards the coast yep. in Torquay um, just to afford him a better life. We were living in the city at this stage and, and just really wanted to get out of that and, and move out to the bush. So had uh, baby Kai, had BJ, my second son, um, and continued to work my way through the fitness industry, ended up buying a gym um, with an, another mate and and life was really good. Probably 2010, um, my marriage started to break down and my wife and I realised we'd been together since we were, you know, teenagers yep. and, and it was uh, time to part ways. So we traversed our, our way through divorce, which was uh, heartbreaking and, and hard and um, sort of the beginning of me starting to assess my behavioural patterns yep. a little bit um, and the toxic the toxicity from my childhood came with that industry yeah. as well. So I would be, um, you know, training harder than I ever trained in my life. I got addicted to, gave up, quit footy. It was a bit hard on the body. Started getting into ultra running yeah. and triathlons and stuff. Realised that to offset that um, sort of diligence, I suppose, I, I needed to get as hammered as I could on the weekends yep. with, with clients and mates and stuff like that. So that imbalance was still there. Um, so the story so the story you were telling a sort of a 15, 16-year-old kid back in Sunbury is the same story you're still telling now yeah. that you own a gym, that it's work hard, play hard. Yep. The gyms almost become your new community. Yeah, your, it really your, was. Your new church. Yep. Um, and But still, still run... From an egoic sense, definitely. Yep, we we were very um, we would pride ourselves on our connection to our clients. You know, it was a little gym; we couldn't afford all the shiny equipment, but we the, 
the focus was on customer service and ensuring that the clients get the best results possible. Um, had a really good staff base um, of, of mates. 